place k completely randomly, meaning the initial value of the centroids are purely random. You chose those. Then randomly assign the samples to each of these centroids. So the assignment of the samples to each centroid also is completely random. Then you, so this happens, what happens in the first bullet? You see here, initialize K centroids. K distincts are chosen randomly from the data set and the centroids are placed at their location. So you choose the centroids, you put them there. It means all the samples are randomly assigned to each of these centroids. But the rule is that you cannot double do a double assignment. One sample or one instance cannot be assigned to two centers or two centroids. Only one to one assignment. Okay. After you do this, then you calculate the distance to the assigned centroid. Okay. <clears throat> then you calculate the centroid of that group, whatever it is. Let's say now you say I have 10 samples that belongs to centroid one. Okay. And this, because it was randomly assigned, it could be all over. You calculate the assignment, this centroid of this new 10 samples, and you say the centroid of this is going to move to this new location. So wherever the centroid was that belonged to this 10, now is going to move to the new location. Okay. Now, this is the new location, and you iterate through. So this means that you measure the distance after the assignment. So now you have a new center, centroid location. You do reassignment. Whatever is closest to the centroid, you assign it. And then the ones that are farther away, they get assigned to a different centroid. So this causes the centroid to move in every step. You have a new location for the centroid and a new set of instances gets assigned to that centroid based on the distance. So you see that at the beginning, you had completely a random uh, assignment. Next phase, you move one closer. It becomes sort of coherent a little bit. The next one becomes a little bit more coherent. And eventually, you get to a point where the centroid is not moving because you have assigned the right uh, samples to that centroid. So the centroid is not moving anymore. OK, so let's see what, how it works. Let's, I think visually, it's a lot easier to see this. OK, so we said k is equal to 5. So randomly assign these five red points to this. You see, four of them are here, and one is over here, completely random. Then you say, OK. I have some of these samples that could be scattered all over this place have been randomly assigned to this first one. Okay. You calculate the centroid of those samples, and now you have a new location. So this guy is going to move to the new location. You see, right now, this didn't move much, this didn't move much, this didn't move much. Maybe this one moved a little bit, but not much. It's hard to see. This one, as soon as you do a second round, you see this moved over here. This one that was close moved over here. This one was moved over here. And this one that was sitting here, or it was sitting here, now is moved closer to the center of this. And this one has moved closer to this, which was there almost, but maybe moved a little bit. Then the next one, you see things get centered again. This one hasn't moved much, the first on top. This one is becoming more centered. This one is moving a little bit, and this one is moving a little bit more. In the in the in the when it gets to the end, you see that things are getting centered. This one is also 
the top one, the yellow one is moving to the center. And this one is closing to the orange one. And then this one gets re reassigned. Pay attention to the boundary, how the boundaries are changing as well. When the boundary are changing, it means some of the stuff that previously were assigned to this cluster, now they've moved here, you see, in this figure. So this gets there uh, pretty quickly. Let me show you another um, example from a different, uh, let me see, yeah, this one actually. So this is another example that you can see, you see? no uh, assignment. Here the assignment for the clusters are done completely randomly. They say we have three clusters. You see the yellow ones all belong to the same cluster. The pink ones belong to the second cluster and the green ones belong to the same cluster. See it's completely randomly assigned. And the location of all of them are kind of here. So you calculate the centroid of the orange one, it's come here, the center, uh, the centroid of the green one, very close to it, and the centroid of the pink ones, or magenta, more or less same place. Then you take the closest one to the center, to the centroid, and you basically reassign them. You say, okay, this sample, for example, this yellow one is far away from these guys. So this doesn't belong to the centroid. I'm going to reassign it to the centroid that's closest to this. Okay. So because they're close to one another, so it's going to reassign it to this. Green ones are going to get reassigned to that. And then yellow one gets reassigned to this. Now, why these centroids are here because the centroids haven't been calculated yet. So now that you have a new assignment, you're going to calculate, recalculate the centroid. As soon as you recalculate the centroid, the centroid of this comes close to this, this close to this, and this close to this. And then you iterate one more time and this gets focused on this. So that's another sort of example to look at. So for p means how many, in, normally how many iteration in order to know the centroid is not moving? It, it's hard to tell because it depends on the data, but a sign is that if the, based on the number of iterations, if the centroid position or coordinates is not moving anymore or moves a little bit, it's an indication that you need to stop. So you basically say, if this coordinate x of the coordinate of the centroid and y of the coordinates uh, of the centroid is not moving more than 0.1 stop okay. okay so that's that's an indication that uh you need to put a stopping condition otherwise this gets better and better by as you increase the number of iterations but if the changes are very small it's a waste of time so you put a criterion that if it's not moving more than a certain amount, I consider that a stopping condition or I, I consider that the centroid has settled. And remember, in order for the centroid coordinate to, ch to move or change, you need to reassign samples. If the assignment samples are not reassigned, the centroid is not gonna move. Remember that. So, a lot of times at the end, the samples at the edge are the ones that get reassigned. The ones closest to the cluster are not going to move at all because they always favor the cluster that are close to the centroid compared to the other ones. There's no reason for reassignment. So only the ones at the edge are the ones that could be reassigned. But the general criterion is you specify a threshold and you say, if the centroid is not moving beyond this threshold, stop. Okay, now uh, we get to the impact of initial conditions, random initial conditions. This initial conditions are pretty tricky, okay? So if you 
look at, because we randomized the location of the centroid and the assignments were also randomized to each of these. If you start from a different run where these centroids were assigned differently, you can end up with a different solution. See here is solution one with one random condition. This is the same problem with a different initialized value. These are completely different groups. There are five still, but look at the boundaries. They're very different. Okay. One is breaking up this cluster, this grouping into two. Another one is breaking this beige or the orange area into two. Okay. So <coughs> this is pretty troublesome, right? You said, if this is the case, it means we have no chance. How can we trust this k-mean algorithm? Because it's so dependent on the initial condition. Well, the source of the problem comes from the fact that this is basically an optimization algorithm. You have a formula for the calculation of the within a cluster distance. And you keep calculating this cluster distance, within cluster distance. And your optimization is to minimize this average distance, meaning you want to make the distance between the points in a cluster as small as possible to make a cluster, right? That, that kind of makes sense. So this optimization, if it's a nonlinear optimization and has, then definitely it could potentially have local minimas. And the different res results that you see here is a function of the, uh, of the fact that you end up at different local minima at every point. Okay, and this, uh, it's a standard problem with optimization that nonlinear optimization always has local minima and you have to come up with a way to get around it. Okay, so what is the approach here? How do we get around the initial condition problem? We need to define a metric known as inertia and the inertia is basically the sum of the Euclidean distance to the centroid for each cluster, okay? So this is the formulation for it, and it's normally referred to as inertia, okay? So if you think about it, this is more or less similar to the concept of variance. You see, what is the definition of variance? Sample minus the mean squared and sum. This is kind of a similar idea. So you are trying to basically, your optimization, inertia is, similar to minimizing the variance between the input space or the one, the samples that belong to the same cluster should have the minimum variance. And then between clusters, you should have a large variance. And then again, within one another one, you should get small variance. So the, we call this the inertial metric, okay? So, if you want to get a good cluster, you have to minimize this inertia. <coughs> and then there's a new definition known as score. The score is always the highest value for the score is the better one. And smaller score is always the bad number. So it's a lot of times the score basically go between zero and one. In this case, we define the score as the negative of inertia. Because in negative numbers, if the number is large, it means it's very small. And then if it's uh, uh, if the negative number has a absolute value, which is a small, is an indication which is large. In this case, it matches up with the concept of basic definition of score. Okay, but the general idea doesn't change. Inertia is this, if you calculate the inertia, the largest inertia is actually not a good cluster. But when you convert it to score, that large number is actually better because an indication that uh, it's a negative number and it works out that higher score is better compared to lower score. So that's just a side note. And uh, so we define the inertia, then we come up with a way to get around this 
uh, random initialization issue. <coughs> so k-mean plus plus is a solution to the random choice of initial conditions. And the paper that's defined by David Arthur and Sergei Vasilevitsky is basically say, just deal with the initial condition in a specific way. Okay, so let's see how do we get around using k-mean plus plus with the issue we discussed regarding the random approach. Okay, so randomly select the first centroid from the data point. So in this approach, we just choose one centroid, not all of them randomly. Just one is chosen randomly. For each data point, computes its distance from the nearest previously chosen centroid. So you choose a one centroid in random. Then take each data point and calculate the distance to the nearest centroid. If it's one, you calculate the distance to that and you choose that first. Then you choose a second centroid. So now the centroids are chosen one by one. Here is the part that you need to pay attention. Uh, select the next centroid from the data point such that the probability of choosing a point as a centroid is directly proportional to its distance from the nearest previously chosen centroid. What that means is that if you're going to choose the second centroid, make sure that this center, centroid is, has the highest probability to be the farthest from the current centroid. Meaning, mathematically choose the th centroid to be farthest away from this because we use the distance the euclidean distance as a probability measure so if the distance is larger large the probability goes up so this approach will cause the second centroid to be farthest from the first centroid okay you may say how would this help if I put the centroids farthest away from each other, how is that going to help us with reducing and not ending up the initial, the random initial condition problem? The idea here is that uh, <clears throat> good clusters are separate from each other. This is intuitive, right? If you have a good cluster, it means the clusters themselves should have some white space between them or sparse samples between them. And uh, the, within the cluster, you have a dense group of samples. So by pushing the second centroid and the third centroid away from the other ones, you guarantee this idea of clusters are completely separated from each other. That's the k-mean plus plus approach choice of cent uh, centroids. You say k is equal to five, choose them one by one and put them farthest away from each other when you're assigning. Don't assign them randomly at the beginning. This is the meaning of k plus plus approach. The rest of the algorithm, recalculation of this, uh, reassignment of the samples and relocation of the centroid is still similar to k-mean. So the plus plus is just taking care of the initial condition. So this approach addresses this problem. Dependence on the initial conditions is significantly reduced. Here it says the rest of the k-mean platforms is the same. The k-mean algorithm is much less likely. The k-mean plus plus. Let me just put this here so that. I'll update this. Is much less, well, actually it doesn't need that because we're talking about the general approach. By this modification, the algorithm is much less likely to converge to a suboptimal solution. So, um, so when we choosing uh, between first the second uh, K, as a second, first the centroid, the second centroid, 
Uh, do we, like the first centroid, after we randomly choose, do we optimize it to figure out the, like use a whole data set to test what's the uh, likely location would be? After determining that one, then we're choosing the second centroid far away from the first one? Correct. Okay. And then third one away from the, the other two and fourth one away from the others. Okay. And as I said, the intuition behind this is that you want to push the, the centroids far away from each other because centroids are supposed to be large distance away from each other and the samples within those clusters have to be close to one another. Pay attention that in this approach, the centroids are chosen based on the sample coordinates are not averaged. When you're choosing centroid, you take one of the samples, not somewhere in between. In the iteration process, the centroid calculation could not, could be not necessarily one of the samples coordinate, but at the beginning they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have a question too. Sure. So aside from being able to optimize the distance between the centroids for the K mean plus plus, is it also able to give you like some guidance on like, oh, should I have picked five centroids versus seven centroids? Unfortunately not. This will not allow you to do that. But there is another method that we can use the inertia to sort of determine the best choice of because remember, this is still a k-mean, and you have to make up your mind at the beginning. Mm, okay. So w whether you choose it one by one, still you have to choose five or four, whatever you decide at the beginning. But there is a way to address that particular issue that you mentioned, that I'll talk about in a couple of slides. About it. So Thanks. I have a question. When we use sure. the k-mean class, you I know you're choosing the centroid one by one, but once you have one finish, then you're choosing the second one far away. May I know when you run the iteration, the first one still will, will be moving or fixed? The first centroid, when you run the, when you're choosing the second one far away. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fixed. Oh, I see. But so you're not gonna change it at the beginning, otherwise, your chase uh, will be chasing our tail, basically. I know, but how do it's you It's gonna be a moving target. No, no, this is how you choose the centroids. After you've chosen the centroid, then you start running the k-mean. And apply k-mean. But this approach guarantees that the centroids are far away, far away from each other, that's all. Okay, so you see that the heart of the k-mean approach is distance calculation. And that takes a lot of time, especially if the number of samples is pretty high. You're gonna end up with a situation where uh, you end up with a lot of uh, sample uh, distance calculation. So another paper that was uh, initially published in 2003, and then I think there was a modification in 2010 if I remember correctly, that um, they said in order to avoid many distance, cal you know, blindly calculating distance calculation, always think of uh, points in groups of three, okay? And you know, if you, if you look, if you form a triangle between three samples, there is a famous uh, triangle inequality problem that in the old days, they call it the donkey axiom. And what that mean, what they meant was that if you assume three points and put hay in one vertex and put the donkey at the other vertex, the donkey always follows the shortest path to the hay rather than going the two sides and get to the hay. So if donkey can figure that out, we should definitely make use of that, right? 
criteria. And this is sometimes they refer to it as triangular inequality. So this says one side is always less than the sum of the other two sides. So if this is known, I don't have to calculate all three sides to figure out that this is the shortest distance. So use this to do some sort of data compression. Okay, And this is the sort of the accelerated k-mean. And the idea, although it's pretty simple, but Elkin did this and uh, presented in a paper in 2003. And the scikit-learn learn library, if it defaults to Elkin approach, if it sees the data is dense. So there is a way to figure out if the data is sparse or dense. And after it does that preliminary calculation, it defaults to the Elkin algorithm, which is this uh, using this triangle inequality to speed up the algorithm. And then if the data happens to be sparse, then this becomes hard because you, you can't really form that kind of, you can still form, but the triangle value cal uh, calculations are gonna be, <coughs> is not gonna be easy. So the K-mean probably works same speed, meaning you cannot benefit from the speed optimization much. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I have another question. Uh, sure. Um, Suppose that you, you choose a 1K, I mean, you choose a one centroid, you get an initial. And if you're choosing, like a data set has a million data set data. If you choose a 1 million centroid, you get a zero, the initial. Correct, and correct. So is there some way like a formula try to penalize you, try to choosing too many uh, centroid, come out a little bit, uh, uh, economic effect uh, considered as uh, how do we approaching the uh, k-value, I mean the, the, the central the number. Uh, if we plot the uh, initial with the k, uh, isn't, uh, it will all be a monotonic uh, decrease uh, to essentially to zero. But is there some way like uh, to uh, stand the way to make the curve go up, uh, essentially make the cost essentially higher so yeah, yeah, I, and you're talking about constraint optimization. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. so something. there is definitely a way to do that. The only problem is that this is a hard optimization problem. Mm -hmm. See, look at this as the criterion index. Yeah. <coughs> there is another version of this known as WVC. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a slightly different uh, formulation of this. And what you're saying is put a penalty term here. Yeah. Lambda plus the norm of the K, for example. Yeah, something. Okay, absolute many, value of K. Uh, and then this alpha controls, if you go beyond a certain limit, is you're going to get penalized and it will basically not let you pass that. This is a sort of a, a Lagrangian approach to optimization or constraint optimization. Yeah. This is definitely uh, an approach you can use, but remember, k-means tries to avoid this optimization problem altogether by coming up with the fast algorithm. Okay, the only part that's computationally intensive in the k-means is the distance calculation, but it doesn't run. Try to run the optimizer. I presented this to show you that there is an optimization problem, but we use a suboptimal approach to this optimization problem. Because if you try to find the location, the optimum value for this or the minimum value of this, you end up with many local minimas. So in general, it becomes a hard problem. But all the standard techniques that are available to hard optimization problem to avoid local minima still are available here and we can run it. But what I'm saying is that k-means does not use the optimal approach as a solution. It just presented here to show that this is a real optimization problem. But the fact that we end up with inconsistent results depending on the initial condition 
is because our optimization problem has is very nonlinear and has many local minimas. So adding a Lagrange multiplier to it or a constraint optimization, you still cannot have to come up with a way to solve the local minimum issue. So what they normally do for this approach to figure out the limitation on K is, um, let me show it because the discussion has come up a lot here, is to, um, let me see the word happen. Oh, this is the one, yeah. So optimal choice, so let me jump here because there are a lot of questions here. So let me talk about this and then we can go back and cover the other cases. So the optimal choice of K says, okay, still use your ad hoc approach, but don't focus because the problem with the calculation of an optimum value is that it's not a convex optimization problem. And if it's not a convex opt optimization problem, it means there's no potential minimum for this. Why? Because if you keep increasing the number of Ks, as you said, 1.1K, meaning every single point becomes, so the K becomes equivalent to the number of samples. This inertia or this distance measure, the sum of the distance measure keeps going to a lower value. But when it gets to large numbers, the change would be 0 0.0001. So just looking for the absolute minimum is not going to work because this keeps going down, even by a small amount. What we normally do in this kind of optimization is to put a constraint. You said if the changes or to put a tolerance. You say, if the, if the criterion index, in this case, inertia, is not changing more than this, say, I'm done. But if you apply that, you still have to run this K up to hundreds and to you know, large numbers. So they notice that in the first few values of clusters, this thing basically goes down, the inertia goes down, significantly in the first few samples of values of K. And then there's an elbow here, meaning you get a sharp change and then tapering off here. If you continue with the large number of Ks, this thing will go down like this. It won't flatten out. It keeps going down. And they say, okay, look for this elbow and that will determine your choice of K. <coughs> Here, our elbow is at four, K equal to four. Five could also be chosen. So if we do four, we're okay. If we do five, we're good. But if you keep adding this, probably it's not, you won't benefit much considering the computational cost of this algorithm. But that could definitely be the constraint optimization with tolerance is the standard approach to <coughs> solving this problem as well. It's just that there's no guarantee you're gonna end up with the absolute minimum. So this problem is not what they call in math, a well-posed problem. Meaning that it's more rely on the search, very much data dependent but what normally people f do in practice is to use this elbow method. There's another one called the silhouette charts that is a little bit more involved. The code is in the sample code so that I've already provided, but uh, I, you can look at that. And if you're interested, we can go over that. But I thought that that would be probably just because it's another approach to this elbow detection of the elbow. So my uh, so elbow uh, approach is uh, for example, if my understanding so if I gonna using no uh, k mean plus plus, then I using elbow approach first to decide what's my initial k first. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. You have to run it basically and analyze it because if there is a large discrepancy, let's say it's supposed to be fifty and you use four. If you don't have a clue at the beginning, 
then you run it this k mean plus plus to get an indication what what the proper values are at so, least get a ballpark for it and yeah. then you so kind of go through this and then rerun the project or problem so, after so, you determine mm -hmm. that this four or five whatever then you go and run the standard mean uh, the k mean yeah, but uh, once I yeah I get a four or five, then I run the standard k mean. But uh, my point is, yeah, I, yeah. how do I choose in my second century so I can, I I, I can choose in like ten, like far away from four. What the guy? No, no, no. Uh, okay, so the k mean plus plus. Remember, is try to solve the dependency on the initial condition. Is not try to solve your k value. Yes. You see, let's say you have decided that K is going to be four or five. Now, if you want to use this, you'd say, okay, choose the first centroid. Then use the K-mean plus plus approach to choose the second centroid. Then third, fourth, and fifth. Stop. Okay. Got when it. you're done with this, then run the standard K-mean. Okay, got it. And this way, if you run this k-mean approach multiple times, then you will not run into any problems anymore. Dependence on the initial condition is minimized by, by doing that. All right, so we talked about the accelerated k-mean by using eliminating some of the distance calculation using the triangular inequality. Then uh, the second approach, which is called the mini batch K-mean is a 2010 paper that significantly impacted the performance of K-mean. Uh, and that the speed up due to mini batch was pretty uh, important and significant. So, and this especially useful when your data set, as the example was mentioned, like millions of data, data points. If you, your data set is very large, this mini batch approach has a significant uh, um, improvement because it basically breaks up the data into small chunks and performs optimization or performs clustering on piecemeal data rather than the full data. So how's that possible? Of course, when you do the piecemeal approach, you don't get a full picture of all the data points, but it's an incremental approach that uh, you can use to eventually load your data. One of the key issues with large data sets is that a lot of times they don't fit into the memory of your computer. So this approach was devised so that you can actually do it piece by piece and use the information in the previous stage to upgrade the data uh, or load the data incrementally. So there are two aspects of this. One is the fact that it would fit into the data the memory. And the second thing is keeping the information consistent and passing it on from one to the other. So if you apply the k-mean approach, you see that the performance of the k-mean compared to the standard k-mean is kind of worse. But the elbow still, you can recognize the elbow. But think about it, doing over 10 million samples or doing it over 100,000 samples or let's say 10,000 samples at a time. Look at the performance is still worse than the k-mean, but comparable. There's a constant offset between the k-mean and the uh, mini batch k-mean. And then look at the speed. This is on the y-axis on the second side. On this, on the y-axis on the second figure, you see the uh, time. I think these are in seconds. And this is you see how much a lot less it is the blue curve in terms of time compared to the standard k-mean. And as I said, a lot of cases, if the data set is large, you cannot even fit it into the memory. So you don't have any choice but the mini batch k-mean.
All right, let's talk a little bit about the limitations of the K-mean, and then uh, maybe we stop at, uh, at this point, and then we continue the rest on, on Wednesday. Limitation of K-mean, K-mean has many benefits, uh, and one is it's fast, and it's also scalable. You can basically, using the mini batch, you can apply it to small set, large set data set. But one of the some of the shortcomings you're already familiar with, key needs to be k needs to be determined upfront. Multiple run multiple runs are needed to avoid suboptimal solution. If the shape of the cluster, this is a very important to pay attention. If the shape of the clusters vary varies, it normally does not perform well. So it expects the shape to be more or less similar. To the to each other, the cluster shapes to be the similar, meaning that if and it's supposed to be uh, uh, spherical. That's another point. Non-spherical shape is a problem. So if you have a shape of a cluster that's oval or ellipsoid, then you're gonna k-mean normally has problems with it. Also, if the density of the clusters varies significantly then it runs into trouble. So these are some of the known problems with the k-means. Uh, here is a case where you have ellipsoid clusters and you apply k-mean and in this case, eh, in the left-hand side, it does okay. On the right-hand side, it's terrible actually. It identifies the wrong uh, clusters altogether. So this is an indication of some of the shortcomings of the k-mean. One thing that could potentially help you when you're dealing with the k-mean shortcoming is to scale your data. This is a common practice in when you're dealing with model reduction. If you're familiar with PCA, you know that you normally normalize or standardize the data. And uh, this is also another approach that you can uh, sort of scale the data and that tends, there's not guarantee, but normally it improves the performance. So this is a tip to keep in mind. All right, I think uh, I'll wrap it up at this point. Uh, then we continue with the <clears throat> clustering application. My suggestion is to read the rest. There are not that many slides left. We have about maybe six or seven slides. Also review the, the Jupyter notebook that I've posted. Please review and try to run that. Also, there are three questions that I would like you guys to, um, let me see where I put it here. That's the clustering homework. You see here, this is a 7-1 that on, for, on Wednesday is due. What is the impact of random initial conditions on k-mean clustering? Just something that we just discussed. Describe a technique to select the right number of clusters when using k-mean. We talked about one. You can investigate the other one, which is also available. Uh, this one uh, we didn't talk about, so maybe we can skip this one till we get for the next. For the So at least on the first two, please try to read uh, the review the lecture notes and also do a little bit of research on your side on, on the side so we can have a group discussion at the beginning of next lecture that should help us to sort of review some of the stuff that we covered this uh, session as well all right uh, if there's no questions I appreciate it and uh, I'll uh, See you guys all uh, on Wednesday evening. Yeah. Can cool. I ask one more question before? Sure, sure. For the mini batch case, um, we assume that um, uh, we don't load the data together, suppose it's too big. Uh, however, in the calculation uh, point of view, we don't need to use all the data at the same time. Um, Essentially, uh, you load all the data together, divide the mini batch, or you just uh, devise your calculation in batch. Uh, that's not too much difference, isn't it? 
um, because you always calculate you only see you calculate that one is the distance. Uh, you choose a centroid. Uh, you just any point coming, you just calculate the distance, assign the distance. To yeah, but if you have if you have ten million samples compared to a subset of it, yeah, how can you how can you be confident on the centroid? And the beauty of this approach is that still works if those samples are chosen properly. But you continue to calculate, isn't it? The, because your calculation, the mean, uh, the distance of the mean, you just, uh, each data point, you calculate continuously. So really no, uh, if you feed all the data in the memory or you read the data by batch, that's, uh, is that much from a coding point of view, the calculation point of view, that's a difference. Uh, okay, so let me ask you this. If, if you have, let's, let's make it two extreme case, thousands, mini batch of thousand, and the full data set is 10 million. You're telling me that, the, uh, and let's section the d data into three clusters, okay? Yeah. You're telling me that the mean of 300 samples is the same as no. uh, the mean of the mean distance of 3 no. million, let's say? No, what I don't mean, like, see, you have a trillion data, okay? Uh, you calculate the, uh, the mean value and the distance is continuously, you know? You're not gonna read uh, like uh, one terabyte of data at once. You, unless you, you read like uh, uh, 100 megabytes at once, you still get the same calculation, isn't it? You read and continue doing that. It is cumulative. Uh, the distance and the mean all is cumulative. You just add yes. one by one. Yes, you calculate one by one, but you need to have that data in memory, don't you? No, you just read it. I mean, just like you have, let's see, we, we have a real situation. Okay, so you're saying basically this is like a mini batch. It's always, isn't it? My, my mini batch. No, no, no. When, when you load the data, full data into memory, all the data is in memory. Yeah, but a calculation, you still go one by one, sequentially. You not have a, like a parallel or something. It's always a sequentially. You're like reading a file or you- Okay, okay, so hold on, hold on. Yeah. You're telling me that if I have 10 points and I calculate the average, is similar mm -hmm. to calculating average of one plus two and then average of one plus three and then, is that how it is? Is that what you th what you're saying? Well, you you summary is and that you you what you do is add them together, then you divide at the end. You yes, you well, if you don't have all the data in memory, how can you divide all of them together? You 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 like read and uh, doing that one, it's always the case in the real world. No, no, that's not always the case unless you have a recursive algorithm for calculation of the mean. This is not going to work. Because if you want to calculate the average of 100 points, it's not the same thing of averaging 10 points and then average of the next 10 points and the average of the oh, next no. points. The I, I only don't... way to make the average of 10 points work in sequence is that you write the average calculation as a recursive algorithm, meaning you take the previous average plus the new sample. Average of the previous value plus the new sample. And every time you do this calculation, the weighting on the, on the previous value should change. So what I'm saying is the formulation of the average is completely different when you read it little by little and when you have the full data. So what do you mean is that the mini batch essentially calculate the section of the data. They don't calculate uh, the data accumulated. They also the load the data section by section into memory. Uh, they but they keep track the of the previous section. values in memory. No, no, no. Uh, what do you mean essentially you calculate the centroid and all this one, each batch is separately, but not accumulatively. In mini batch, you do the average at the end. Otherwise, how can you look at the full data? And then mathematically has no difference. Your mini batch or you read all the five other ones, it's the same. But, uh, but your curve, I don't see that's a really smooth. It's a kind of a vibrating. That means uh, 
your mini batch doesn't really do that uh, at the end. Is essentially you load certain data, you calculate that as a separate data set. Is that you have uh, like you have uh, like a cluster has a different layer, like a three D dimension. You have a cluster in the two D, but you have another uh, the batch each different layer. Then you concatenate this one together to get that curve. Look like, isn't it? Uh, I don't. I don't, I don't understand actually what you're saying, really. <clears throat> I, I think the, uh, uh, the answer to this is that unless you formulate your problem in a recursive way that you can accumulate the data on top of each other, uh, then uh, you cannot just perform ce centroid calculation based on 10% of the data and expect this 10% calculation be the same as full calculation, calculation on the full data set. So unless you formulate it, your problem in such a way that the first batch calculation gets extended to the next batch, it carries over and propagates through. Otherwise, it won't work. Mm. Okay. Okay, and I think w one thing I suggest, we can maybe uh, look at the code, how it's done. First, the memory upload, and then also the way it's, the distance is calculated. And if you don't sample your uh, data set properly, this approach could run into trouble because you can get only from a section of the date distribution of the data, not a representation of the full distribution. And so suddenly your centroid is going to change significantly as soon as the number of sa new samples are introduced into the system. So anyway, I think it's best if you look at the algorithm, we can discuss it again to see how it works best. Thank you. Sure. Just a quick question about the homework is a, just do Wednesday is by a written note or? Yeah, just, just write the answer to those and post it to the um, Google Drive and then we'll discuss those. But the real project or the homework for this section is the one that's due on uh, July 10th which is a project more or less. So one and two. This part is due in, on July 10th, which is a mini project. These two first question, prepare for uh, Wednesday. Prepare an answer, post it to the, uh, web, uh, the Google Drive, and also we'll discuss it at the beginning of the lecture Thank on you. Wednesday. So for the homework, you will illustrate next Wednesday or we just start doing, just read through and do by ourselves? Yes, yeah. This is something that you can read the notes and also do a little bit of research on these first two. Are no, you talking I'm, about the discussion or are you talking about this homework? Yeah, I'm talking about the homework, not discussion. The homework is something that's part of it we just covered today. Part of it we need to cover still, but this is what you need to sort of do by July 10th. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, thank you very much guys. I'll, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let me see if everyone asked their questions or no, still there's some question left. All right, if there's no more uh, questions, we'll, uh, you know, finish the, the the session today, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Uh, professor, yes. Uh, may I ask a simple question? Yes, please. I think it's related to the on Wednesday, but um, I just I just barely saw that. Uh, but basically, since since the initial variables are random, does does that make the every graph different, even though if it's the same data set? Are you talking about the mini batch? Is that what Correct. your question? Yeah. Okay. 
So the question is, you're saying that because all the data is random, uh -huh. then what? What is the question? So then, does that mean that every, even even if the data the data set's the same, the batch is the same, does that mean that the um, every type of output is going to be different, even though it's the same data? Yeah, I mean each section. You see, remember that you're adding more and more data. Uh huh. So and then calculating these cluster, updating this cluster with more samples. Uh huh. So oh. as you add more samples, of course, the coordinates of the centroid and align assignment of these samples will change, right? Yes, yes. But the idea is that if the samples are done properly and a proper weighting is done, meaning that you don't introduce 10 samples that belongs to one cluster and one sample that belongs to the other cluster. So there is some sort of even distribution across the whole distribution then you expect that these updates will not change significantly. Ah, I see. Okay. okay. I make so the best way to visualize it, think about a normal distribution. Okay. Uh -huh. And then under the curve, you have all the samples available, right? Right. Yeah. Now sure. you can take samples from the left corner only. You take 10 samples from that left corner. Uh huh. If you calculate the average of those 10 samples on the left-hand side, you get a very different mean than if you take these samples and distribute it across the full distribution. Oh, I see. Yes. Then the mean that you calculate is going to be close to the true mean. But if you just take a blob from one corner and calculate the mean, the mean is going to be, you know, just the mean of that. So those samples that are very biased. Oh, I see. Okay. So that's what I meant that you need to be careful with the way you decide your batches and so on and so forth. Ah, thank you, professor. Sure. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you guys on uh, Wednesday. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.